Congratulations. You're welcome, Anita. <laughs> you know, I've asked the question and I had the opportunity to come and speak in school a number of times and, and really get to know a lot of these students. Uh, today, I want to ask you guys, and, and not just you, but the rest of us, why do we do this? You spend a year of your lives, well, seven months or eight months, whatever it is, nine months, two nights a week, come into this place for two and a half hours, three hours, four hours sometimes. <laughs> you spent so much time, energy, effort on your own, studying, fulfilling everything that Nate asks of you, hours and hours <laughs> and hours of intensive labor, Studying the Word. You spent time together in worship. Every, two, every Monday, every Wednesday night, you spent time together in worship. And today you, is the completion of that, and you got a pretty little piece of paper inside of a pretty little frame. But what was the purpose? Why? Why did you sacrifice that time? I'm, I'm sure it wasn't so you could stand in front of the church today and be recognized. But you understood that God had a calling and a purpose in your life, and you said, God, however, it, however I can get to that, show me. Some of you, it was a supernatural thing that God did in your life or spoke through someone else, said, hey, you need to be in school. Some of you, you just knew that as soon as, as, soon as it was time when Casey said, we're starting school, you knew it was you. Some of you had been through a couple years of school before. But you said, no, this is a new season, this is a new day, and I'm committing myself. But why did you go every week? Why did you do the homework? Why did you do all that? And that's a question that each and every one of us asks ourselves on a daily basis. Every time we come to this place, why do you come here? Why do you sacrifice your time? Why do you sacrifice yourselves? Why do you, why do you come to this place? Is it just to see friends? Is it to, to be a part of a community, part of a family? Why do you come to this place? Why do you spend time on a daily basis reading the Word of God? Why do you spend time worshiping? Why do you spend time leading your family in prayer? Why do you do it? Another question uh, that you... Some of you were asked in, in your exit interviews is, what did you expect from the school? What did, when you came in, what did you expect God to do? Some of you came in with a lot of expectations. Some of those expectations were met. Some of them were a challenge. Same question for you today. What do you expect from church? What do you expect us to fulfill for your life? What do you expect pastors of this place and this house? What do you expect from our worship team every week? Is your expectation to come in here and just to be fed and then have that sustenance for the rest of the week? Or is your expectation to learn how to grow in Christ for yourself? You see, these students came in with an expectation. And from their interviews and from speaking to them, I think most of their expectations were blown away because of the sacrifice that they made to do the work, to commit themselves. Do you come to church with an expectation from us as leaders, as pastors? Or have you learned like these students to come, to get up every day, get out of bed with an expectation that God is going to do amazing and wonderful things in your life? Because if you come to this place with expectation that I'm going to do something for you or Jody's going to do something for you or the worship team, I hate to disappoint you, but we will disappoint you. There will be a time when I speak a word or the, the worship team, maybe they didn't play the song, just the song that you liked and you leave frustrated because your expectation was for man and not from a heavenly father who loves you and who desires to give so much more than you could get from any human. What was your expectation? 
You see in Ephesians chapter 4, the writer here writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Today, students, I'm talking to you, but I'm talking to all of us as well. Like Gene said, a piece of paper doesn't mean you were called. I think you said that. Something like that. I was listening, I promise. I was just... Do I have a coffee there or something? Thank you. Yeah. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Can I ask you a question? What was the measure of Christ's gift? Gift? What was the measure of his gift? Was it a small gift? Was it beyond measure? Then how much more does he give gifts? If he gives according to what he gave... If that's what this verse says. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. How much grace have you received? You've received grace according to the measure which he gave. Do you understand that today? We live our lives, some of us in in, in depression. We live our lives in fear. We live our lives in places of, of, of doubt and insecurity. But how much grace has God given you for that? You see, our problem isn't what God is willing to give. The problem is what we have the ability to receive. How do you put yourself in a place of receiving? You commit yourself. Students, you've committed yourself this year. And we honor that today. Does your commitment just look like coming to church on Sunday, smiling, shaking some hands, loving some people, and then leaving this place and expecting what you receive, the grace you receive in this place, to sustain you for the rest of your week? If so, you have problems. Because we will let you down. I use this example all the time. How, many, how, how would my relationship look with my wife if I just spoke to her on Sundays and Wednesdays? You laugh, but that's how we treat God sometimes. And then we complain about where we're at in life. This should not be. I want to challenge you today. Students, I want to challenge you guys today. That what he's called you into, he's, he's supplied the grace to sustain you through. The problem is never with the amount of grace that God is giving. The problem is, is our ability to receive and understand what that grace looks like. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one... Oh, I'm in the wrong verse here. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. What things? So what need do you have? What need do you have? Because he's already filled it. I don't preach a prosperity gospel. I preach of the goodness of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because he gives you grace to get, not, not just to get through, not to survive. We have this mentality, and I almost said it because I've said it before. We have this mentality that we're called as Christians to survive. No. You are more than overcomers through Christ Jesus. You haven't called to just make it. You haven't been called to just, just, just do life every day and get your ticket punched to heaven and when you die, you, you get something. No, your reward is today. You have breath in your lungs and the opportunity to transform everyone around you. Your family, your friends. You have that opportunity. 
It's not for one day. I tell, I tell students all the time when I was preaching to them, your destiny is not something you achieve. Your destiny is not something you achieve. Every single one of us. You have a call of God on your life. If you have breath in your lungs, just try it out real quick. Good, you're alive. Oh, I was worried for a second. You have breath in your lungs. You have a call and a destiny on your life. You have a purpose. And it's not something that will just magically happen one day. It's not something that that you achieve one day and you finally say, oh my goodness, I did it. I pastored a church for 10 years and they didn't kick me out. I've been here, never been fired from it. It was good. I, I did it. Now I will just go like the elves and float away into the sunset. I will disappear into the east. Sorry, I've been watching The Hobbit like 800 times this week. My daughter's crazy. We will disappear into the east. That's not what it's about. It's about running the race to completion. You know you're done when you see his face before you. When you are standing before his throne and you are physically, spiritually in that place, that's when you know you did it, okay? And until that day, you aren't allowed to quit. Some of you in this place with gray in your hair or little to none up there. Lyle, where you at? Just kidding. I'm not call, I won't call anybody out. Zig. <laughs> Some of you are in this place and you said, well, I did this and I reached my prime. And I love what Pastor Gene says. I can't do what I once did, but I couldn't do then what God has before me today. And if you think that you've arrived or completed anything in life, I, I'm going to tell you, you are, you're writing your last chapter. Because your destiny is what you do today with what you have in front of you. Students, the call of God on your life is not for something you will achieve one day. Yes, you're going to do amazing things. But every time that you, com- that you complete something in this world, I told you guys the last night of school, that isn't a, it's not a time of completion. Today isn't a time of completion. It's a time to step into the new beginning that God has for you. It's time to step into the season equipped and empowered to do what you've been called to do. Listen, church, if you come here every Sunday and you just, you just want to receive and receive and, and you're never willing to step into what God has for you, pretty soon your cup's going to be full how much can you put in a cup that's full it grows stagnant it grows stale you get frustrated you usually blame me and I just yell at Casey and Nate and Corey so for their sake please stop If he has grace sufficient for you, he's given, he's poured out all grace, and you aren't living in a place that you want to live, put your toes clear out there because I just want to stomp on him real quick. It's no one's fault but yours. Yeah, you might have circumstances, you might have struggles, other people may have hurt you, but guess what? You get to pick, you get to choose what you do with you. And that's it. And if you can make it through the day just controlling yourself really well, if you can just do one day at a time controlling yourself really, really well, then the influence you have on people, the influence you have in life will be substantially, exponentially magnified. Why? Because you've learned to control you well. If you can stop coming here with the expectation that Jay is going to feed me really well today and come with the expectation of I am going to meet with the Father, with the body of believers and the family of God. I'm going to find someone to love on today. It's going to be good. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to be built up and edified by the Word of God because it's going to be true. The worship in this place is going to be amazing. I'm going to, I'm going to have access to the presence of God, not because of a worship team or a song that we sing, but because you've chosen to come into that place and you've come here with that expectation, then I promise you church would look a lot different you can come to this church you can you can sit here in this place and never be changed because of your heart and your attitude you can come and be part of a family and that's all you get out of it and if you're if you just want to be family you just need people to be around you to 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 help you if that's where you're at in life right now okay i hope you find that here but you will be challenged to go for more 
Students, you have done amazing things this year. But if you're satisfied, then you've missed it. If you're satisfied, then you missed it. Because school was not taught to, or, or not purposed to give you more knowledge and more understanding solely. It was meant to teach you a lifestyle of finding the more. Where am I? And he, verse 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Everybody say he gave. He gave people as gifts to himself. He gave people as gifts to the body of Christ. He gave people. It's like, what do you give a, a guy who has everything? God has everything. What did he give to himself? He gave people. He gave it to the body. He gave some. Every ministry looks different. We talk about pastors, evangelists, teachers, prophets, Apostles. I always forget apostles, Steve. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's supposed to be first. <laughs> but he gave to the church a very precious gift. Everybody look square dead at the person next to you. Just stare him down in the forehead and say, you are a gift to the church. He gave some. Ministries look different. But every ministry has the same purpose. Listen, I know that some of you students, you're like, well, I don't know. Okay, stop talking to the person next to you. I said just one thing. <laughs> Jeez. Give them an inch. I don't got enough time for you to chat today, okay? <laughs> I'm not even through my intro, but I'm going to quit here in a second. Listen to me carefully. In church culture today, we put such a high priority on trying to figure out what your title is. If you need a title to do your ministry, you're not doing your ministry correctly. I see my, I see my, uh, I see my good friend, Pastor Venegas, back here. And Julio Venegas, he's the pastor of our our. Hispanic ministry, ministry, Vida Abundante. And one, yeah. <laughs> one thing, when I sat down with Pastor Julio, and we just talked about ministry here and, and them coming over in life, doing church here, doing it well, I knew that it was the right thing because I got the opportunity to sit down with Pastor Julio. And I knew that no matter if he had a title, if he had a building, if he had finances, if he had resources, none of that mattered. He was still going to find a group of people to minister to, to pastor, to lead, and to lead well. Why? Because he'd been doing it for 15 years without any support. I will open up the bank account for Pastor Julio. Why? Because he's shown himself faithful to the call that God has placed upon him. And I know that the soil that he carries is good soil to plant seed in. If you're looking for a title, you're looking for the wrong thing. Yes, there comes open doors when you receive certificates and license and ordinations and things like that. Doors open up. Prove yourself... You, you want to go after that knowledge. You want to go after that understanding. With, with the only thought process in that is, I, need, I want this so that I can honor God well. 
with me, with the gift that he's given to the church. I want the gift that he's given to the church to be the absolute best gift it could possibly be. I have a title. I am Pastor Jason R. Warner. It says it on my wall. I have a certificate of ordination because I did the work, because I sacrificed the time, I really sacrificed my life. <laughs> And I'm proud of that. But that being on my wall doesn't make me who I am. If I, if, if I didn't have it on my wall, I would still love people. I'd still go sit down with coffee for people. I might not have the time that I needed to do it the way I'd like to. But I do it because it's who I am. Pastor Julio does it because it's who he is. Steve does it because it's who he is. Why do you do it? Why do you not do it? He gave it the gift to the church of pastors, apostles, evangelists, teachers, prophets. Why? For the equipping of the saints. And for the edifying of the body of Christ. Your jobs are to serve people. And to build the body of Christ. Every believer on the face of this planet, if you have breath in your lungs, you're called to equip, to edify. For the work of service and the building up of the body of Christ. But you see, we see so much in life. You can see it in schools. You can see it in culture. You can turn on the TV. You see it in the places you work. You see it in a lot of churches. I won't say it. We see it here. You can just judge for yourself, your own heart. That's not my job. <laughs> my job is to tell you the truth. But we live in a culture of consumers, not of servers. God didn't call you to come here and consume. Yes, you come here. You're edified. You're built up. You're fed. But if you're not doing that for other people, then you're a consumer. And you are not fulfilling the call of God on your life. You say, well, I'm not trained. I don't got a piece of paper. I don't care. What can you do with what you have? God is not in the business of calling people into laziness. That's a good word. You just need to hear that. You don't get to a place in life where you're allowed to be lazy. Just because I'm your senior pastor doesn't give me the right to stop going after God with everything I have, thinking I achieved anything. And if I can't do it, you definitely can't do it. If Pastor Steve hasn't earned the right to just relax and do nothing for the rest of his life, what makes you think you have? If Pastor Gene has heard a word from the Lord said he's not done with you yet. He has a call and a purpose for your life. What makes you think you're any greater than? I'm not trying to be arrogant or anything like that today. What I'm saying is, what are you using as your excuse to not fulfill your destiny? What's your excuse? Every time that God tells us something in the Bible, if he gives us revelation, he always says, walk in it or go into it or speak it. You see, the kingdom of God is not in words, but in action. You can put a bumper sticker on your car that tells everyone that, you know, everyone that you drive in front of that you graduated from school of ministry it doesn't mean anything unless you learn to love people well. You're no longer babies. School ministry students, I'm talking to you. You're no longer allowed. Because you've received the revelation, you've received knowledge, you've received instruction. You're no longer allowed to live the way you've lived. You're called to something higher.
What happens when you choose to be a worker rather than a consumer? What happens when you take the word of God literally and start living it out in your life? I'm going to go through this very quickly. I want to finish this sermon today. So I'm going to go through this quickly. What happens? What does it look like? How can you tell in your life if you're being a consumer or you're being a servant, a worship, or a, a, a worker in the kingdom of God? Number one, what happens is you begin to realize that you've taken ownership for yourself. You've taken personal responsibility for yourself. Listen, I hear it all the time. People coming to me and say, well, this person did this and this person did this. And, and I, don't, I don't play those games. I'm like, okay, so what are you going to do about it? What was your response? Because like I said before, you get to control you. And you begin to take ownership for your, your personal responsibility and ownership for your walk with God. It becomes so much more than it could ever be if you just come and get fed here on Sundays. Your relationship with God becomes yours and not mine. Listen, we are not trying to build anyone up in this place. I don't want to be your God man. I don't want to be the person you come to when you need to hear God's voice because he's my God, but he's also your God. He's put me in a place of leadership where I have the opportunity to speak life and love and destiny and truth into your life, and I honor him for that. I'm so thankful for that. I'm grateful for the platform that I have every week to speak into your life. But listen, if I'm the only voice you're hearing, you're in trouble. Just ask my wife. She's got to listen to it every day. You take personal responsibility for your relationship with Christ. Reading and worship become essential in your life. Why don't you read? Why don't you worship God? Why don't you get into the Word? Why don't you study more? Bottom line is because in our culture, in our society, you don't have to. It's not essential for you every single day to wake up and to get into the Word, to walk with Holy Spirit. Because we live in a culture and a society that is still, thankfully, pretty tolerant and accepting of beliefs. No matter what you've seen on the news. Once you walk out of your front door with the fear of your life being taken, then we know something's changed. But the bottom line is you don't have to. You can live your life every day and be lazy Christian, be complacent, be comfortable, and you will make it to heaven one day if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you're not going to do very much on this earth. See, your life in Christ isn't about you making it. It's about who makes it with you. When you become a worker rather than a consumer, you begin to see God move wherever you go. I hear it all the time. Why don't we see miracles? Why don't we see all these things more? Why, what's wrong with America? What's wrong with our culture? We go overseas to, on the mission field and we see people being healed and transformed. You know, you see fingers grow out and legs and all these amazing things. And, and, and you see people raised from the dead. And, you know, it's just like the real Bible. <laughs> why don't you see God move everywhere you go I'll just be honest with me why don't I see God move everywhere I go because oftentimes I'm not taking him with me why aren't you seeing God move in your workplace is it because he's weak no it's because you left him in the car on Caleb I'm just being real with you today. Is that okay? I mean, why doesn't God go move in Walmart? Every time I go in there, I see someone who's, who's hobbling or crippled. It's, it's because I left him in the car. Because I don't go into, I don't walk through life with the expectation that God wants to do really good things because he loves people even more than I do. <laughs> I'll stop. What's stopping all these things? Nothing. Except you. And except me. What's stopping revival, restoration from happening in your family? Nothing. 
just you, just me. Because he's already paid the price. Why would he withhold the gift? And it was a big price. If he already paid the price for it, why would he withhold it? Does he wait until you're good enough? Thank God, no. He's just waiting for your yes. He's waiting for you to step out in expectation to see him move. We haven't taken responsibility for revival or renewal or outpouring. We wait for the next speaker to come in to bring it. We wait for the next big event so that we can get that next good touch. We wait for the next group to come in so that we can see miracles happen again. All you're doing is not taking personal responsibility for what God called you to do. You're allowing someone else to walk in the favor that he's called you to walk in. I'm going to stop. It's not hard. When we talk about it, we, you know, I'm, maybe you're a little offended today. Maybe I was a little too difficult on you today. (laughs) That's okay. You'll either get over it or you won't. (laughs) (laughs) I suggest you get over it for your sake because (laughs) you're not hurting me any. You're only hurting yourself. Listen to me. I don't say these things. I don't challenge you on a weekly basis. I don't, my goal in this place, sometimes, some days, days like today, is I ask myself, how can I make people uncomfortable with the truth? Because oftentimes we're not uncomfortable, we're too comfortable. Listen, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to be our comforter, but we don't need him because we're never uncomfortable. (laughs) So sometimes you just need to be pressed to a place of uncomfort so that you have a reliance on him. Was anyone uncomfortable just a little bit with anything I said today? Please say yes. Okay, good. But... Here's the deal. School, ministry students, church, pastors on staff. Visitors. God has a purpose for you. But there's no. The Holy Spirit is not just some little fairy throwing out pixie dust, empowering you, okay? Every time God reveals something in Scripture, there is a call to do something. Whether it's pray, whether it's receive, whether it's walk, whether it's in declaring, whether it's whatever it is, if you wait for good things to happen... Without ever taking responsibility for your relationship with him, you will struggle. I promise you. I'm not speaking death over your life. It's just the way it is. If you surrender your life to him and give him your yes on a consistent basis, your life will look different. It's not going to be all roses and what is that phrase yeah it's not going to be all sunshine and rainbows because life happens and in this life you will have trouble that's a promise of god but his grace will be filling your life continually if you would just know him so i challenge you that day today do something do something with what god has called you to do something with the yes Do something in your life, school of ministry students. 
Do something from today. Don't get comfortable because of what you've completed. Step out. Whether it's at work, whether it's in second year school of ministry, whether it's in in just challenging people, whether it's in evangelism, whether it's in teaching, preaching, no matter where it is, let your yes be yes. And do something with what you have. When Aaron... And Moses went to Aaron, Moses, or God came to Moses, and Moses had all the excuses in the world to not do what God had called him to do. How many of you feel like that some days? You go to, thank you for your honesty, the two of you. You feel like, why would God would you ever use me? I have this in my life and this in my life. I struggle here. I struggle. Hey, listen. Moses stuttered and he couldn't speak. And God said, hey, I want you to go speak in front of the most powerful man on the face of the planet. Yay! I was like, heck no, I ain't doing that. If you look at me, heal me first or something. He said, no, what do you have in your hand? He said, I have a staff. He said, okay, that's what I'll use. I ask you this today. What do you have in your hand? Coffee. Good deal. (laughs) You are blessed and highly favored of the Lord, my son. What do you have in your hand? Like Pastor Gene challenged you, what can you do with what you have today? Because if you're faithful with that, your tomorrow will look different. If you're faithful with your today, your tomorrow will look different. Father, what have you put in our hands? Father, I thank you for the calling and the destinies that you placed on every individual under the sound of my voice today. Father, I thank you that you've entrusted and empowered us with the destinies of others. And Father, we don't take that lightly. For these School of Ministry students today, as they step into this next season of their lives, I pray that you would increase their passion. Father, that you would increase their capacity for more revelation of your goodness and your love. Father, as they've committed themselves, their time to you, God, I just pray that you would honor them very well, even more than what we could honor them. Father, for the rest of of us in this place, God, challenge us not to be just consumers. Challenge us, Father, that when we are full and when we are filled, Father, that we would pour out for the sole purpose of getting more of you to seeing your kingdom be revealed on this planet to see change and revelation and renewal in our families and our children and our parents. Father, I thank you that today is the start of this new season. That today you have filled us with grace that is sufficient not to maintain but so that we could overcome that we could be more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We love you and praise you. In your son's precious and holy name I pray. Amen. God bless you today. I want to challenge. uh, Thank you. If you are new to Abundant Life, I want to encourage you just to come over and have some lunch with us today. It's going to be a good time um, hanging out. And uh, the rest of you, God bless you this week. Go take responsibility for what God's called you to do. Amen.